Uh. Well, always funny to me whenever I hear recording in progress and the little disclaimer comes up, it cracks me up every time because I just imagine somebody racing to hit leave meeting. <laughs> just <laughs> gone. <laughs> Hopefully not in this room. <laughs> right. Not. So we've we've done some really, really deep connection calls, Adam, like we just finished up with, um, and a few people are on it from God, we spent pretty much the first half of the year together and we would record everything just cause you know, someone would, you know, might be missing the meeting or whatever. We didn't want them to miss the content. And then we'd go so deep in the conversation and I would hit stop record, um, delete immediately. And everyone trusted me that, you know, that information wouldn't go out, but it was just, we just had, as men, it was it was men in the group. I know we have some women in here. It was some of the deepest conversations I've had in my entire life. And I didn't know where they would go, but it was just, it was incredible, Adam. And, and I think it kind, kind of like conversations that you and I have had where, yeah. you know, um, and, and my wife, my wife's going to gonna hear this and I've told her, it's like, I still don't have the courage to tell her everything right just because either it's self-confidence issues with me or it's, it's all me well so open yourself there's, up there's an aspect to that you know i i discussed that idea with a mentor a long time ago and i said you know there's things that haven't been uncovered in and, and he asked me does it serve you more or does it help your relationship more does it serve her more because if you're doing if i was doing it in that case just to get it off my back but it didn't really serve any other healing purpose then i'm i might need to re you know consider just dying with it you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's a fine line yeah yeah i you I've, know i've asked nikki that do you want me to you know there are things She's like, I don't need to know everything. Yeah. And Nikki's your wife for rec reference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Two-time okay. wife. We'll get into that. Oh, yeah, I, I shouldn't let out the, let the cat. We'll, we'll get into that. I'm still letting people in the room here. Yeah. These, and I think, just as we're kind of pre-talking, you know, I think people are craving really deep conversations with someone that they can they can trust who they can be vulnerable to to not feel judged you know i've met people like oh i don't judge people and i'm like bs right we all we all judge people at some level but as we get to know them the individual i think we we judge a lot less and we just really start to understand where they're coming from at a much deeper level. And that to me is, you know, honestly, Adam, and we'll, we'll probably get into it is I, I think I know that this country, this world people are just craving deeper relationships and I literally just saw somebody, one of the high up executives on Facebook who left Facebook and says, we made a huge mistake. Like social media is really hurting people. And we knew it. Yep. We knew it. And it's not just Facebook, it's all of them. So having these conversations, I think is just extremely important. So I'm going to give everyone another minute to get in and I'm going to monitor the chat as well. We already got a couple messages. Um, I got an amen, which is awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to know. That'll make it easy. I'll talk to John tonight since what I'm going to talk about is relatively embarrassing. Yeah. So in a room full of fine people that don't know me. <laughs> we'll get you to know, that. <laughs> Who is that? That's uh, Preston. Yeah, we'll okay. Get to that, Preston. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I I know some of these people in the room really, really well. And um, and I never call up. I never call out anybody. If someone wants to share, that's great. And I'll just let everyone know that Adam is such on the same wavelength as we are in terms of looking back at our lives and just going, "Wow, I am so glad the people that I love did not give up on me." 
Mm. Right. Like I tell so many people, like if my kids gave up on me as a dad, I wouldn't have the relationship I had with them today. So don't give up on your dad. Don't give up on your mom. Don't give up on your spouse. Uh, I think it's, I think we, we give up way too easy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I'm going to introduce Adam who I met. I, I was trying to figure out Adam, how you and I met, I think it was 2015. It was. And I invited you, we somehow connected and you came and spoke at a boss event. And for people that don't know better opportunities for single soldiers. And we had a rock star lineup at that, at that workshop, right? Everything from Jim Shields, real estate mogul to, I want to say that, um, uh, who was it? Scott Mann, the Green Beret, spoke at that one too. Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. Was he with that event? Oh, that might sound familiar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he kind of emceed. He's phenomenal. We just had a we just had an incredible Greg was incredible. there. Yep. 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 I think did we have the gentleman, the veteran who created the credit card? Was he there with you? Yes. Yes. That rings he, the bell for sure. Yeah, yeah. This guy legitimately invented the credit card strip on the credit card. He was in his 80s. He was in tears the whole time. He was a Korean. Uh, Korean War vet. But anyways, Adam and I hit it up. He connected with me, I don't know, several months ago, and he just shared what he has going on and shared a bit of his story. I'm like, oh man, you you have to share. So Adam and I go way back um, eight years now. And hearing his story, I just want to just, just introduce um, Adam and I'm going to put myself on mute and we're all in for a treat. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Then we're going to go into a little bit of a question and answer. And Adam, it's all you. All right. I'm going to put a disclaimer out there. I learned a long time ago. I started speaking a handful of years ago, and I, I learned by intuitive nature to tell everybody immediately that I was nervous in front of them, not nervous for myself. And it's not like that. I'm like, okay, I have to be able to bring you guys something worth these 90 minutes of investment, right? And, and that part, that, that weighs on me in a very good productive way. But to let you know that I've worked with a strategist over the last couple of years, because when Phil saw me in 15, I was, I had a story, but I had no structure and I didn't know how to flow. And I didn't know how to do all the things that speakers do. And so I do now, but I got a little bit of a note down here below. So don't, don't laugh at me and don't judge me too hard because I won't look down the whole time. I promise. But so we're going to get into a little bit of the story, but then also to share some mindset ideas from these seven pillars that I've been shown over the years and that kind of reverse engineered my process of where I've, where I was and where I am. And essentially, I just want to start off by telling you guys that I've married the same woman twice. <laughs> it's, it's so loaded and so pregnant with possibilities, right? And when I see a group that comes for ADU, I know that they're they're hungry, they're growth-minded people looking for a pivot point to help them accelerate and do whatever that is. So I am just a guy bringing a story and some things that I've learned. When we want to learn from the masters of all the self-help world stuff, we, it, it's all out there. I'm not there to compete with any of those guys. We can refer to that. A lot of my stuff is going to be familiar in that, but I will say this off the bat. As I get going here, please... Don't judge me for I have sinned. And these are big things and such a cuss word like that in public these days. But anyway, I've been addicted to IV drugs. I had multiple affairs. I tanked a nursing career. I was not there for my two kids when they were born. My wife was a high school sweetheart and I wrecked our marriage. It led to all sorts of terrible things down the road, ended up combat deployment to Afghanistan, South Kandahar with first brigade out of Fort Riley from there, come home, start learning about what PTSD is with a panic attack in public for the first time, had no idea what that was. And that took a few years to even get a handle on what had happened. All that being said, the crux of my message and, and hopefully that I can relay tonight is when we find ourselves, whether it's it's a terrible situation that we've caused or we're just living life and, and things happen or in and around us, you know, not people born in poverty are not asking to be born in poverty or born in a war zone. They're not asking for that. But those were cards they were dealt. But regardless if we did it or it's a situational thing, all of us get off track sometimes. And the premise of what I say is 
I believe that more people than not are suffering from a deep-seated frustration or a discontentment about where they are in their life on the outside, their job, their social circles, whatever that is, even their relationships, the energy in their home, that's disconnected from what they have a vision of on the inside, what their heart wants, what their core values are, what their beliefs are. There's an incongruency and a detachment there. And I believe from my story for sure that discontentment and from talking with hundreds of people over the years, discontentment, I believe is the root cause of the lack of fulfillment and the depression and general malaise that we're going through. You know, Henry David Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And if he was born in 20th century, 21st century, he'd be saying most men and women are living lives of quiet desperation. And I believe it's not so much that we get stuck in certain areas. It's not so much that the getting stuck is the problem and what's going to help me get unstuck here. I believe if we, if we fix the discontentment issue, that will handle being stuck and we will be able to move on. We'll be able to get that six figure job that happened for me. We'll be able to advance through and thrive with PTSD and eliminate or, or even notch down, just dial down the effects that we get of paranoia and anxiety. For those of you who can relate to that with me again, I believe it's coming from out of sync. You know, it can be very expensive when we're discontented. It can cost us jobs. I ended in an 85 grand a year nursing career as a level one trauma nurse because I didn't know how to handle what was going on inside me. And it led to the end of that without a fallback plan. I had no replacement income that came. That actually led to the story of how I re-enlisted back in the army because I have two different enlistments and I don't want to confuse people. So I'll just kind of leave that there for now. But yeah, and then mine sort of culminated in a car crash figuratively of a near death overdose in the study of my home, which was next to my master bedroom across from my son's room, you know, when he was a baby and it took some years, but I eventually had this sort of, this sort of epiphany. I was having trouble hearing my own voice, my own authentic core, what my soul was asking me to do or want, you know, what I was attracted to. I was so, I couldn't hear my own voice because I was too busy listening to everyone else's. And I believe that's a powerful idea and, and it changed my life. It, it changed my life for sure. So what I want to do is bring this over here and I'm going to share this, give you guys a little bit of viewing pleasure, hopefully. All right. So we know that we know where we are today and we're going to go here again in a nutshell, the pretty marketing version that my strategist helped me come up with about a year or so ago. Here's some of that. And the first premise is this, this road to fulfillment is paved with our own purpose and our own potential, not other people's expectations of us, right? And I'm going to share a, a quick story in a minute about how that messed with me. But if you guys want to take screenshots, you know, do what you want to do, man. This, this is for you. So we wanted that to play, but that's not going to play. <laughs> so we won't tell anybody. These seven pillars, again, screenshot it, steal it. It's fine. Use it. You're not going to get a whole lot from here, and, and it's mainly because of our time tonight, and I want to be able to be, be respectful and bring as much impact as I can. But with the seven pillars that I go through, and these are all going to be reflected in a book that's in process of being written right now, and you can look at you know perception, master your perception, master your direction, and then there's power. There's power in the promise. And so those two, I'm going to do my best to get through those tonight. The next five, if you want more information on that, there's an overview. I have a seven pillars overview. I'm going to go to the next slide. There's a QR code. You can download it, whatever you want. It's uh, grab it, use it, but it's going to, it's an 18 page PDF. And that's the gist right there. If you guys want to take a second and grab that, hit it with your camera. Yep. It'll come up with the URL. It should anyway, it's all been tested 17 times today. And that'll be, you guys can save that in the browser. We can come back to that, but we're going to, we're going to go through some of those things. All right. Now, again, like I said about the seven pillars, I've learned from giants. One thing that I want you guys to do, here's my hope. I'm going to share some stories from my life that are very exposing. I want you to find the sprinkles of your life within my story and see what you can grab onto because there, there there's plenty of material there. Now, You know, can I see the chat, Phil? Is that, 
can we get that chat up? I'm wondering, because I kind of like communicating and seeing if people can put a little emojis in there. I'm wondering if you guys, I got it up now. If you guys, if anybody here has felt like an outsider in their life, maybe growing up, black sheep of the family, sort of square peg, round hole, throw me an emoji in there. I, I don't care what you do. A wave, a uh, big time, Phil, thank you very much. A little hang loose if you can find it. Uh, you know, throw me the bird if you want. I know we're in a military group. I'll take it as love. I definitely grew up with that feeling. I was born and raised in Southwest Detroit by a bike gang, cocaine doing, people beating up dad. Austin, thank you very much. Travis, Alex, Alexander, I don't want to assume. Chicone, that's, that's a strong name, man. I hope I said that right. I like a lot of mob movies. My mom and dad were hardcore raised in Detroit. Both high school dropouts, mom pregnant when she was 18 with me. They didn't get married until I was later, until I was a little bit older, but they did. And at 14 years old, I started challenging the status quo. And it came out of me one day when my mom came home from work. She's coming home. She was an office manager, just looked drained of life. Again, drops her purse on the table. And I'm like, mom, if you hate what you do so much, why don't you change it? And I wasn't being, you know, I wasn't being smart or nothing. I, I was honestly asking her. And she essentially looked at me and said, that's okay. One day you'll grow up, you'll see. And I'm like, okay, I'm never going to do anything I hate. And like a voodoo curse, man, what did I spend the next 15 years of my life doing, right? And not that I hated my military career. I was not at all, but I was in nursing. I was on the civilian side. I got my nursing through the military and you'd think that that'd be great, but that's not how it felt for me. I got out of the army and L let me back up a little bit. Dad says I, I had some pretty good skill in hockey in high school. And I was thinking about going up and, and possibly pay playing college juniors, maybe get a look by the Detroit Red Wings, right? Where I grew up. And when I took that to them to say, hey, I got this idea. I'd been playing for a while and I was already playing AAA travel. And they said, uh, hey, bud, you're 16. It's time to grow up and get a job. So my dad hooked me up with his connections in the truck driving world and got me a job at a landfill. So thanks, dad. Right up my alley, right? Like I'm living the dream over here. But regardless, I end up going into the army because I had to get a real job, they told me. I get my, you know, the recruiter said, hey, we can send you to San Antonio, Texas, where it'll be nursing school. I'm 18 years old. He goes, it'll be an eight to one ratio of females to males. And I'm like, dude, no snow in the wintertime. And I get, you know, that kind of shooting fish in a barrel. Okay, let's go. No offense, ladies. I was 18. So I did that. I get back a year and a half later. No. We're going to slow down. That summer after graduation, I met my wife who she was still in, in high school. She had a, two years left to go. She had just finished sophomore year. I had just finished senior year. We met. There was something different about her. She didn't, she wasn't loose and free. She had some depth to her and, and, and real self-respect and a quietness. I like, I really fell in love with her soul for three months. We became best friends. No hanky panky, no stuff like that. And then we shared a kiss that September and 10 years later, or 10 days later, I left for basic training and I was gone for 18 months outside of, you know, a Christmas time leave. So I wasn't too serious about my boyfriend status at that point, but we always stayed in contact and that relationship was there. I got home and from there, we began talking, you know, I proposed to her at her dad's house in the kitchen. She was shocked. I had already asked the dad for permission. I looked him in the eyes a couple of weeks before, before, Hey, can I marry your daughter? And, you know, he's thinking we're crazy because I was only 21 and she was 19 at the time, but we had a real thing going. We got married. And then I was really starting to get at this point, seriously frustrated with my nursing job. I'm two years in, I'm working in nursing homes. And it was very draining on a young man like that when I had these big dreams of this life I was going to live. And I remember trying different money-making activities, selling vacuums door to door and, and trying to sell wholesale stuff from eBay and my mother-in-law's coffee shop that she had. None of that stuff went through. But I had met this guy at the same time I came back and his name was Mike. And he played a very significant part of my life. But 
when I came home, he was the first, he was playing music in my mother-in-law's coffee shop and I met him and it, and he started telling me things about God and, and like the soul and, and the universe and the afterlife and what happens after death. And, and he was a Christian, but he wasn't like a church guy. And he, and I didn't have much experience outside of that. You know, I, I didn't really know anything, but he was teaching me how to actually learn about things about spirituality. And then he ended up standing in our wedding and, and he meant a lot to me. And then some years happened and there was a gap there. But what happened in this meantime, where I'm getting frustrated in nursing, my wife and I get married a year later, we conceive. And it was like a switch flipped in my brain. When I found out we were having our first son, our first child, I did not, I had wanted kids since I was a teenager. I was looking forward to getting married, having a bunch of kids. And then it happened and coupled with my serious discontentment and then a new family being born happening, I'm 23. I lost my mind. I went back to all the old stuff. I went back to the nature of San Antonio and sowing those wild oats. And, and then affairs started at work. From there, I was working midnights full time from 11 to 7. And I was going to school full time. And I'd go in the morning to get my RN because I had people around me saying, hey, if you're upset or you want, you know, you need more money, you need more scope of practice, you can get into the hospitals, go finish your RN. So I go back to school to do more of what I didn't want to do. I did not hate the job. I actually enjoyed nursing a lot. It was the environment and the system that was so heavy that it, I always tell people it choked the joy out of the job for me, right? So this is happening and I just, I start taking pills on night shift at the nursing home. I, if, if someone was sleeping, I used, I, I would sign off their medication as given, but if they were sleeping, I took it. And it started with Darvacets and Vicodin. I don't even know if Darvacets on the market anymore. But I would never take somebody's, just to be clear, I would never take somebody's pills if they were awake. I gave it to them. There was plenty of opportunity otherwise. So that's how that started. And I was taking those in the morning when I got off work. I'd go to a Burger King, go through the drive through get a sausage, egg, and cheese croissant, sit under the tree and in the shade where nobody could see me. And I ate that thing down and I'd pop pills. It got to the point where I was putting about five to six extra strength Vicodin down at one time. And, you know, I, I'm not a big guy. I never have been. I was doing that to silence the alarms of my conscience for the betrayal of my wife, my son, myself, my family. Like it was, I was entering down a very dark road and that road would go on for some serious time. There was, once I did finish my RN, I was still using, but this time I'm in the hospitals and I'm working level one trauma in downtown Detroit. I met a woman there in a class, in a in a at continuing education class, and her and I started a relationship that would go on for over a year. And at this point, my wife and I are three or four years into our marriage, and we're we're beginning to go the route of separation. And I I didn't have the guts to go for a divorce, so I literally became someone that she wanted to leave. And I just remember how passive I was all the time and how cowardly I was. It was not out of devious intent. It never had been, but I was doing devious things. And by September of 06, my life at that moment, I'm on my way to work one night and I start seeing this white smoke come out of the little Saturn LS, a dark green Saturn LS that it was my little buggy. Got it to and from work, girlfriend's house to work, go by the wife's house where the kids are. And that was my little commuter. One night I'm on the way to work downtown and the little white smoke starts coming out, little vape coming out of the, the front of the hood. I get off the highway. I'm losing all power. All the power is dying. I have just enough to get off I-75 in Detroit. I get to the shoulder. I go over to the hood in my full scrubs. I have no idea what I'm doing with cars, but I saw people look under the hoods before. So I looked under the hood. And as soon as I looked under the hood, I opened it and the oxygen hit and a burst of flames just. And the engine was like a torch. And within minutes, the car burned to the ground. I was able to save my car seat for my son and my work bag. And that was about it. That night I go to work and Nikki, my wife, estranged wife calls me and tells me she's in labor with our, our second child. So we had been pregnant that year. And at the same time that 
her and I were pregnant with our second, I had my girlfriend pregnant with our first. That September, when my daughter was born that morning, my car burnt down the night before. Addison was born the next morning. It was about 10 days prior to that. I had convinced, I had convinced my girlfriend to go through with an abortion. And I remember holding my daughter that morning. I felt like a complete failure in every way. I felt like a fraud. I knew I was a liar. But I could, there was two things I couldn't get out of my mind. The drugs, I had to go back and get more because it helped me relax. And then I couldn't get the mistress out of my mind at that time. And so when I, the girlfriend. So when I left, I was in the hospital room maybe eight hours. I left my wife with her mom and our new daughter and I was gone. If that, sometimes it seems to me when I tell the story that it seems like a very dramatic response to someone who just simply wasn't built for the, the, the line of work that I was in, or I didn't, I wasn't in sync with the way that I grew up in hardcore blue collar Detroit when I was a big time dreamer and I wanted this big life. But that's the thing about discontentedness. It, it can put a faulty perception on us. And that faulty perception often leads to devastation that we weren't planning on. And I believe each one of us has been created with a soul that has a purpose to fulfill here. And I like to say all the time, I like to say this, all of us are less without all of us. But it's not just all of us present. It's all of us living the lives that we're supposed to be living in our own authenticity, in our giftings, in our callings. We all have temperaments that, you know, there's all these tests that tell us how we are. But to me, that's a big part of living authentically. It's making the outside world match what the, desi the desires of our heart are, right? Like I keep this thing back here, live your authenticity. So I guess we can probably go to the next one because if you can master your perception, you will master your life's direction. And I'm sharing screen. So is my chat right in your guys' way? Phil, can you give me, is that, it's not in the way? Okay. Now, one of the first ways we can start doing that is this little concept of the radar framework. Simple, but extremely powerful. If I were to leave you one thing in the moment, take, grab it, grab a screenshot, you can look at it later. The one thing that I would say is that an immediate takeaway, if there's anything so far where you're thinking, yes, Adam, discontentment, that, okay, frustration, I'm looking, I'm driving home at night, I'm looking out the windshield and I'm wondering, how did I get here? Is this all there is to life? Anything along those lines. The first thing that I recommend my students do, my clients, my friends, whoever, is we have to stop and start reflecting first on the patterns and the habits that we currently have that are bringing results we don't want. And then we look and we start looking at our upbringing, our conditioning to see where did mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandpa, grandma, however the world, authority figures, church figures, school, where did these pieces come in to give us these foundational paradigms, these mindsets that we have that we're now still delivering on as adults that have created the habits and the patterns that we have in our life that are bringing us the results we don't want. It's the very first thing we do because that's the beginning of the process of increasing awareness. And if we don't increase our awareness, we're toast. So I'll leave you guys with that for now. There can be a little bit more to this. You know, there's plenty of room for conversation on this, but as long as you have that, we can kind of move forward a little bit. All right. Now, that following, my, that following month, I went to uh, I went to a bar to meet with a buddy. This is right after that September, and I this was this was the buddy Mike that I had met before, and he was teaching me things. He was at my wedding. I call him the red dreaded tribal hippie because he was a little Irish dude, pale as a sheet, and he had long, beautiful red hair and dreadlocks, and he played aggressive tribal rock music, and and I liked his style. So I give him a call and this is some years later, we hadn't been in touch, but I asked him to sit down with me and, and we split a pitcher of beer. I was telling him all about this. I'm, you know, Nikki and I aren't working out. I got this girlfriend over here. 
and I'm, I'm going to be a good dad and, and Nikki and I are going to figure those things out and we'll, you know, we'll become friends and I'm going to be a good dad over there, be a good dad to my kids. And, and I'm going to ask God's forgiveness. And, and, and that was where my mind was. And really I was looking for his approval because I knew that he cared about me and nobody else was around in my life anymore at this point. So when I, when I got with Mike and I, and I say these things, he's sipping back on this beer and he's not saying much. I'm like, okay, cool, cool. Um, you know, he's, he's buying it. And he goes, you know, I do believe that God will forgive you. And he goes, I believe he already has. He goes, and I believe that you already are a good dad. And I don't have any doubts that Nikki and you are going to figure things out. He looks at me square in the eyes and it's calm as can be. But that's not what you promised. I was speechless for a good minute or two. One thing that I had never done in my life was is all the dirtbag things that I had done. I didn't betray my word to another man. And for some reason that was in me. I, maybe my dad, I, I don't know. But when he said that, I wasn't ready to change, but it planted a seed. A couple months later, ran into an acquaintance who introduced me to a guy who had been a six-figure engineer at General Motors who went off on his own to be a consultant. He had three offices around the world. He was a high six-figure guy and found out he sold off that business and he was doing entrepreneurship. I think he was in, he, he was in direct sales at the moment in, in a leadership company, information and seminars and things like that, but he was crushing it. And I asked this guy, I said, hey, dude, I want to get out of my nursing career. Can you... Uh, you know, introduce me to this guy so he can mentor me. So he does that. I get the guy's phone number. This is in January, a few months later, a couple months later after meeting with Mike, I'm in this car. I'm in my, it, it, I, it's my baby poop, metallic brown, mercury sable, 1999. I'm sitting in this thing in a single wide driveway in Metro Detroit, January, white sky, endless white sky. The house that we used to live in was empty. It was cold and dark. It, it went from like, that was where my first son was born. Like he came home there. It was filled with warmth and laughter and birthday parties. This was our first home. And he, Don's listening to me. And at this moment, I'm staring at the garage back there with the U of M billboard, the maize and blue thing on there that my dad put, and, or no, that, that I had put on there for the kids. And I'm looking at this white sky in this dark house. I'm rubbing the, the mercury emblem, the plastic emblem on the steering wheel. I'm just fidgeting. I say, Don, you know, I, I want you to mentor me. Okay, what do you want to do? I want to get out of my nursing career. I need, I, you know, a hundred grand would be great. He goes, okay, I'll mentor you. One condition. And he's chewing on chips or something, right? Like I can still remember the humor of him chewing on these chips while I'm at, like, I'm at this wit's end point in my life. He goes, one condition. I said, yeah, name it. I want you to go beg for your wife's forgiveness and try to save your marriage. I'm like, uh, yeah, no disrespect, Don. I'll, I'll do respect. You don't understand. Dude, I've damaged her. You know, things like fidelity and drug use. Wives typically typically don't like these things. And he's... and. What he said next is the reason that I'm standing here tonight sharing these, this, a couple of these stories with you guys. He said, I'm not asking you to be responsible for her response. I'm asking you to do your duty as a man. I'm like, what is with these guys? Like, come on. Buddy with beer, this guy, I just want you to mentor me. And that was, that was his response. And again, you know, I agreed. I remember thinking this is pointless because let me, let me give this a caveat. A week before I talked to Don, I was laying in my girlfriend's bed, laying on my right side, facing the door and the edge of the bed, facing the door to the hallway, little hallway light out there. And there was a shadow that I remember the light, the light hardwood plank floors that she had. 
And I remember just sobbing my, with tears down on her pillow. And all I was thinking about was how much damage I had caused and how much I missed my wife. And then my child, you know, both my kids at this point. And then I have this conversation with Don. Three weeks after my conversation with Don, it was Valentine's Day when our divorce finalized, stamped February 14th on the, on the divorce papers. But since I agreed with Don, I, or I, I bought into his condition, I said, okay, I'll do that. And so I worked at doing that. And I just realized for the first time in my life, I had never shown up as a man. I had never shown up as a grown up, as an adult. If things got hard, I bailed. And between Mike's promise comment and Don saying, do your duty as a man, at this point, even though the divorce was coming, something switched. Divorce happens. Three weeks after that, early March, two to three weeks, I quit all drugs cold turkey forever, never went back. A month after I had tried twice to break up with my girlfriend, didn't go through, I wasn't strong enough yet, kept going back to her. And I was messing with these two women's heads for a couple months. And amazingly, miraculously, like you're talking about, Phil, them, their, their grace and their ability, their capacity to take us back. But I got a third shot. I, it was a weekend in April, a Friday. I broke up with my girlfriend for the first time or for the third time and for the final time. It stuck. That day is a story in and of itself on how I responded there. But then two days later is when I went back to Nikki at the house where we had had our family, where she was with our two kids. And I told her what I had worked on with Don. I told her what I had been doing for the last few months. I told her that I was clean six weeks. And I said, I asked her for forgiveness and she said, okay, she would forgive me. She says, but that doesn't undo the divorce and I'm not undoing it. It's been too long. It was a total of four years that this went on over four years. Excuse me. What happened for me at that point in, in the house when she forgave me was it gave me a little tiny ray of hope. And I said, look, I'm not asking for sex. I'm not asking to get remarried. I'm not asking for anything. I said, if I could sleep on the couch after another week or two, that'd be great. I don't have a place to live. I was crashing on a spare mattress at Mike's. I was living at the girlfriend's part-time, but that's off the table. I didn't, and I was in my car sometimes too, sleeping in the car. I'd go find a lit up parking lot. I'd sleep there. I, it, it was an ugly picture. But before I left the house that day, when she said she was going to forgive me, I grabbed the door handle and I remember turning around and looking at her. And I said, up to this point, I've made you because of me, you've been the pity of your girlfriends. You can imagine the things that her friends were telling her, right? And probably the family too. They were saying it all. Get rid of him, loser. He's never going to change. I said, but I promise you one day because of us, you'll be all their envy. And I wasn't being arrogant about it. But I said, I'm asking this one thing. I want you to trust God and I want you to watch me. That's all I asked her to do if she would pay attention to my actions. And then I went on to do that. I changed my phone number. I got rid of secret email accounts. I changed jobs so I wouldn't go the same routes. Like there was real action taken. And that leads into that next big point of our power is in the performing of our promise. And in the book and in the teaching, I talk about two different types of promises one being the promise or, or the word that we've made to ourselves or others. And also the promise that our potential insinuate, our, our potential lends to. That's a promise, right? He shows so much promise. She's so, she shows so much promise. But power is in the action of actually going after it, actually fulfilling it, doing the things that serve it. And here's a little tool for you guys to, to grab onto. I call it the five-star commitment. These are very simple things. These are not earth shattering ideas, but I find that they've been extremely practical in my life. And these are not easy to master. I don't have them all mastered. I mean, do I have any of them mastered? I don't know. I'm committed to them. That's for sure. But perfection, that's not, that's not the purpose. I tell my kids all the time, progress is king in the land of the process. As long as we're making progress and, and that's a really big deal. So 
if you're going to do one thing today, if there's anything that's resonating for you, I'd like you to think about deciding to commit to something on this list or to commit to the responsibility, to commit to a process or your promise, but to make a decision. There's real power in that. It comes from the Latin word. I don't know what it was, de cadre, de cadre or something, but it means to cut off. To When you decide something, nothing else is an option any longer. There, you're not allowed to change your mind by definition of the word for its original intent. So there's that. Now, the effect of showing up changes things. I gave Nikki the first real apology of my life that day. Six months later, that October, we got remarried. And shortly after that, oh, you might want to know, Don performed our marriage. I think I got to, there's a picture in there somewhere. I don't want to get distracted yet. But after we got remarried and Don performed the wedding, on the banks of the Ohio River in Louisville, Kentucky, our second wedding. My son was actually our ring bearer at that at that wedding, and he didn't exist for the first one. It was it was cute. A couple months later, we got approached by a local church, a couple thousand members every Sunday, and they wanted to do a, a documentary on my wife and me and, and our story. And a five minute, it was a short thing, but it told the story. After that, couples started coming to us, asked for help. We started lending help the best we could from what things that we were doing. Most people ask Nikki, how the hell did you do that with him? How did you take him back? Like that's usually the biggest question we get or she gets. But then even after that, I got approached and, and then speaking began. I went, I got to be able to go to speak to some troubled kids at an academy who were failing two grades or more about what it takes to kind of bounce, you know, to bounce back. And that's, uh, it really went off to the races. But then another enlistment in the army would come just so there's, and that's when, you know, I didn't go back to nursing. So that had to happen. And that's combat PTSD. It's a, it's a story for another time, but I, I definitely, where are we at here? Where are we at? No, no. Did you hear that? Did that sound come through? No, it came through in my freaking headphones. We couldn't get the audio working all day guys. And then like, I don't know. That's Let me know. Because if you took your headphones off, the auto would work. I bet you. That's it. Take your headphones off and play that audio. It played in my headphones. Take the he unplug the headphones from your um computer, and I bet you the audio will work on the video. They're not though. They're in the soundboard. Oh, look. Okay. You so you you can unplug your headphones. I I can unplug them. Now now try the but video. But then now I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Because the audio is routed two different ways. It's a mess. Okay. It's, oh. it's no big deal. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. There you go, guys. There's marriage one. There's marriage two. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're close to wrapping up, Phil. We're close to wrapping up on, on this part. Look, I want you guys to know something as I as I wrap up a little bit of the story part. I don't even know what's next. Yeah, we'll just leave that there for a minute. I want you to know because you're on the call, I see us here. I'm proud of you guys. It it I know what it's like. You show up, you're looking for something, a, a piece to propel forward. I get it. I've been in hundreds, if not thousands of hours of these things myself. I'm still in them. I'm still a student. But I want you to know if you're still breathing, the story's not over. You totally have hope. Where I was sitting in that driveway talking to Don, I had nothing left, not even an, an address where I lived. And, and it changed. If we were in an epic, like I look at this, I look at somebody as being crossing my path when I'm being able to give this, this story or some of these messages that I've learned as your moment of being a hero moment for whatever it is, the thing that it is that you need to do. It can be epic. It can be small. It That doesn't talk about quality. These things can be huge, even if they're smaller things. I don't know what they can be, but the range is huge. Only you know that. But my hope is that you're seeing some of yourself in, in, in even the brief synopsis of what I've given you here. There, there's so much juice coming in the book, it's not even funny. Bonnie Ware was a hospice nurse for decades. And if you don't, just in case somebody doesn't know what hospice is, just in case, 
it's essentially someone gets admitted to hospice when they have hours, if not just a couple days or a few days left to live at the most. The biological life, the doctors have determined it's the, the sand is almost out of the hourglass. She did. She wrote a book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. And I'll only give you the first one tonight. She said, this is the words of people in their eighth and ninth decade of life giving these answers, interviewing hospice patients on their way out. Number one regret. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Unless you're willing to die that death, today is as great as a day as any to make a shift, to make a pivot. I believe that the way that lives have been ch shared, changed through my story, talking to my wife and our story, we've even helped certain people stave off suicide thoughts and, and bounce back and start businesses. That's not us. That's just us being willing to share our story. That's you. That's the person who takes that in and does something with it because we all have a choice all the time. And I believe there are people waiting for you to show up in whatever area you need to, not only for yourself, but to impact their life. Missed opportunities, broken relationships, divorces happening. Some of these things, like part of my story is the fact that I listened to other people's stories and it gave me strength for mine. And that being said, I just kind of want to put a little bit of this onus on the importance of you showing up for what you need to do. And it's not calling you out in some kind of bravado way. I'm hoping my heart's coming across. It's like, what is our tombstone legacy, right? What is the thing written on there? What did we stand for? And for me, the most important thing is the relationship I have with my wife and my kids. After we got married, remarried, we ended up having two more. Our kids today are 11, 12, 17, and 20. And my relationship with that little girl who I was never around for, it is so strong. She has no idea that I wasn't there because I came back soon enough. Thank God for that. Listen to the whisper in your core. That thing that's in there begging you to live your life, begging you to go after the thing, that's the, 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 the real language of the pretty marketing version of authenticity, which the word, even though I use it, half annoys me because it's so polished and self-helpy. But it gets a point across, I hope. It's a big time honor for me to be able to share here tonight. I, I'm not done. I'm looking forward to the rest of everything else that we're doing. But this was the honor that I feel being able to share this with a group like this. I know who follows Phil. I know the work Phil does. This is a big deal to me. And I want you to be able to experience revolutionary freedom in your own life. And this is as I, to me, that is, as I've described it tonight, this is what revolutionary freedom means. And we need you, the real you, to show up and go after whatever it is that you need to go after. Your, break, your breakthrough is ripe for the taking, and I want you to use both hands. So thank you. Well, thanks, Adam. Um, I, I never read that book about the regrets of the dying, but I, I definitely looked up that list. And it's a powerful list. And I've, I've been in hospice with some loved ones before and it's um, the people who work there, by the way, are just incredible, incredible humans for sure. So th the sad thing is we all don't know if we're going into hospice or not going into hospice, right? It could be the people in Hawaii, right? It could be, could be a car accident. I, I heard a story of a, a good friend of mine um, whose best friend's son was on a motorcycle, 19 years old, and randomly fell off and hit the only pole in the street, broke his neck. And by the time the dad got there, literally 35 seconds later, he was gone at 19 years old. 
So I love what you said. Can I ask you a couple of questions and I want to open it up? Yeah, please do. And you know what? I'm going to put. Anyway, can you, my screen just went yellow on you, didn't it? No, that's fine. Yeah, we got you. What's that setting called? Sunrise. Displays. Oh, so, and if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand, just raise your hand. But yeah. we talked about this, Adam, yesterday, and we, we've had several conversations around this. And yeah. there's a few people on this call that have kind of heard this. You know, you talk about your, there was so much going on, you couldn't even hear your own voice yeah. right in your head. So can you talk about a couple of tools or how did you clear out or at least turn down the dial on some of that noise to be able to start to think? I eliminated any voice that was outside the mission. I remember it very, very clearly. I, I started my podcast around that time and it was actually later that year. I started my podcast like at the end of a certain year, but it, it took months of buildup because I was scared to go do the podcast because I thought like there was this fear of certain people not approving that had been authority figures in my life. And I had to come to the idea of going, who's been here the whole time? Who has never left me? Who is on my team? Who am I committed to? Who have I made the ultimate promise to for life? And that, I mean, outside of my wife and my kids, there's nobody else on that list. There's people in my inner circle who support, but, and, and they're not naysayers, but there were, I had to understand, I was, part of it was me allowing their opinions to come in and create a pressure that I didn't, that I didn't deserve to carry. And then part of it was the fact that I had insecurities that Every time I wrote something or I, I did a podcast on something or I had an idea about something, I would pose these things to other people, these people that had been in my life from earlier days. And then it was like, oh, that, that seems a little rough or I don't know if I'd use that language. You know, you're supposed to be a, a Christian guy. And, and, you know, like I would there would always be some correction or tear down of, of what I was doing. And it just eventually led to the idea that I said, you know, if. I have to, if they're not part of the mission, I got to ignore the voices. And then I also stopped reaching out for permission or approval to every little thing that I ever did because I came to a point where I realized I'm not dumb and I have a calling and my wife loves me and we're, she's proud of me and I'm doing good work and I'm helping people. And that should have been enough. And it wasn't mm. until that point. Mm. So an a follow-up question to that, right? Like, and again, I, I have so many regrets around treating the people I love the most, the worst, right? And and you kind of shared that story where you're playing games with two different women at the same time and just, just a horrible thing. But talk to me about, you know, loving on yourself a little bit, right? And trusting yourself because yeah. I heard that other people loved you, but and it, it's kind of weird to say because I still have a hard time conceptually thinking that I love myself, right? Because I, for most of my life, I didn't even like myself, let alone love myself. So can you talk a little bit about that? For me, personally, it came to a point where I had to go back and it was part of, this is how some of the, the radar framework came about, the reflection piece and the awareness, because I had to go back and you hear people talk about this, but I, I went back to thinking about little Adam at, four years old when, when we moved out of Detroit, but just across the borderline, but I was, I was raised in, in that neighborhood until I was 18 anyway. So it didn't really matter. But then I had to go back to the little Adam that took certain deep wounds from my dad when he wasn't intending to do like, again, dude, he came out of a bike gang. He left that for me. He went to work and worked harder for me. I didn't see him a lot, but those caused, those caused some deep gashes in me as a kid. And I had to go back to that kid in my mind. This, this would have, practically speaking, I'm going for walks in the morning with my dog in the sunlight over the last 10, 15 years, like five years. It doesn't matter. It's a continual process. I go out for walks and I'm thinking, and I would go back and try to remember what I thought, what I felt, what my dad looked like back then, and just remind myself now, dude, you didn't do anything wrong there. He didn't leave you. And, and, and it began this process of me looking at things to create a new story, right? You know, I, let me bring this up and let it, let, it, let it sit there for a minute again. Watch this. Don't worry about that. We'll get back to there. This, this identity pathway, I wasn't sure if it was going to come up or not. And there's a lot going on there. 
I understand that. There was, you know, if we look at the bottom in these choices, but in the bottom left here, by continual thought, a story is created. And then we repeat that story and it's red because it can be, it's very risky. It can be very good. It creates champions when we're telling the right story. It creates the life of our dreams when our mindset is, is on track. But when we're not, we're repeating stories that we reinforce all day long for decades that creates an identity in us. And my identity was one of, I'm not a man. Uh, my, my stuff, I'm too much for people. I, I go overboard. I'm a little bit too high, strong, these sort of things. And I had to go through and rewire that. And part of the radar was part of the way that I did it and in, in other ways, but the other factor for me personally, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say it, and I know that we're not in any kind of certain, I don't know, I always feel the need to put 17 disclaimers on this when I say these things in public. But for me, my faith is very critical to my life. I had abandoned the way when I went on my own way, and then I came back and I sought God's forgiveness in my life. For me, I'm a Jesus-following Christian. I barely ever go to a building on a Sunday, which irks most of the family that I have that live in the mountains and carry snakes and scream like chickens. They don't like the fact that I don't go to the building, but I raised my kids by faith. And when I looked at how G I looked at Jesus in the gospels. So the four gospels is what I would do. And I'd look at how he treated people, how he talked with them. And that's what I started looking at in terms of the identity that I should have. Who does God say that I am? And I don't want to preach to anybody. I'm more than willing to talk about these things. But for me, it became a point when I had to believe the one side of all these other voices aren't necessarily the voices that I need to be following. And the other side was I have a spiritual aspect to my life. I'm a spiritual being living in a human body. I do believe that. And who does my maker say that I am? That's, and, and that began another journey of like digging into that deeply. Yeah, let me un unmute myself here. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot of people, Adam, that, and, and you and I both have had hundreds, if not thousands of conversations, and I'm going on 20 years with with ADU, 10 years in its current version, and I've had, I've had a ton of conversations. There's a lot of people that are just in pain. Yeah. Right? And it's not just physical pain. It can show up as physical pain. And uh, several, including myself, are what you what you're talking about living up to the story, right? And it was the story that your dad left you, right, to to do this thing. And if I heard it correctly, he left the gang, got a job, and then was working and wasn't able to spend as much time with you. Did I hear that correctly? That's the gist. Yeah. So, but the way our little our little eight year old Adam and little eight year old Phil take a look at that is dad's not around, right? And I realized this, I think it was in May, I was doing some really deep work and I learned that I have to let little Phil know it's okay to be who, who he is at eight years old and everything's gonna be, everything's gonna work out in perfect order, right? And I don't know if that's a hippie thing or what, you know, talking to my eight year old self, you know, I'm 50, almost 55 right now, but it was never safe to be my, to, to be me. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if anyone has any thoughts. I mean, I've got a couple other questions, but I want to open it up uh, to people in the, in the room. Go ahead, Adam. I, th I think that that's nail on the head. You know, when there was an instance where my, I came home from school one day, I'm eight years old. I walked, I, our school was right around the block. I come home from school and my dad's working in the back. And this is before we moved to the suburbs where he had to really go to work all the time. So he was home still at that point. That happened when I was 10, when he, when, when we moved again, but at eight years old, he was home, he's working on things and I get home and then I walk around his red pickup truck. Remember the trucks with the two fuel tanks. He had the two big gas tanks on each side, like one on each side. And it was, I walk around this monster truck. It was, so, it was like a monster truck to me at that age. I walk around this and there he is on the other side of it, just working on something in the backyard and he goes, hey, boy, good to see you. You know, you're home from school. How's school? Great. Yeah, dad. 
he goes, Hey, go check out the sunroom. There's a, there's a box in there. Go check out, you know? So I go in the little screened in sunroom and I, I'm like, dude, my eyes are like, what? And I heard a little rustle inside the box and there was this puppy full purebred German shepherd, all black, little white spots on the breast chest, you know, on the chest. And I named him Dodger because I love the LA Dodgers back then. They were my favorite team, even though we were in Detroit. I named him Dodger. And when we left and he, we were inseparable, man, inseparable playing in the backyard. We would tackle each other. It was a boy and his dog. Just picture it. That was it. Norman Rockwell. Like that was my life with this dog. Two years later, when we moved to the suburbs, he gave my dog to his dad, who he didn't like that much either, in Detroit still. And within a couple of weeks of that, I go to see my dog and they tell me, oh, he got out. And the dog was gone. That was the first heartbreak my dad delivered. There was another one later breaking up with a girlfriend. There was a handful of these things where he was being the hammer, trying to do the best he could for his family. I know he wasn't trying to crush little Adam. But back then I got crushed. So there's a handful of these situations that I actually had to go through and release. That's part of pillar number three. And releasing, if we're not able to release some of these people from the damage that they caused inadvertent or on purpose, we're the ones that continue to suffer for that. And that is something I wasn't willing to live with anymore. So yeah, made those changes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it goes to, and I heard this from a Marine years ago who was repeatedly molested by his mom's boyfriends. And he said his life changed when he forgived the person, but not the act. Right. Like I forgive you, but not what you did to me. And it'll never happen again, right? That's why I joined the Marine Corps. And I think that is a really good first step. And, you know, when I hear that your, you know, your dad gave your dog to his dad, who knows what was going on there, right? Exactly. Something going on there. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. And I love your framework, right? Because I think there's just, you know, we talked about this yesterday. There's a ton of information out there. We can get lost in information. But the people that I, that I, I still have coaches and I'm like, just tell me what I need to do, right? Just give me, give me a path, give me a framework and just, and just stick to it. And like, you know, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of time off. I'm doing some consulting away from home, but I have not watched TV in eight days. That doesn't sound like much, but it's been a refreshing talking about turning down the noise. Yeah. And I have, I never thought I had time, but now I, I have a lot more time, yeah. right? Whether it's going for walks, <clears throat> my wife and I went for a great walk last night for gosh, probably an hour and a half uh, here in California. It's just, it's just great. Right. And I think we're we're missing out on some great conversations by staying busy for the sake of staying busy. Yeah. Dude, going on walks. If you would have if you take all the walks from me that I've had in the last 10 years away, I bet you remove 80%, 90% of my healing. Mm. Yeah. I, I bet. Yeah. So as we're closing up, you know, I, I know a lot of the, a lot of the people in this room and some people are in, are in some crossroads, right? You know, they're, they're in those jobs that just aren't bringing them any, any joy, some great income. There's some people on here that I know that are kind of almost stuck with in, in opportunities, right? Cause they're paying well. Yep. And how do you, whether the courage or the financial ability to step aside from those and do it. Um, what advice would you give, would you give someone in that situation right now or thoughts to think about? Yeah. yeah. When I was a nurse that my last year and a half as a nurse, I had some of this new information in my mind. I had met Don for that last portion. And when I would talk to people, finding out about this new entrepreneurial world and this in these leadership books. And I, I read Dale Carnegie for the first time. I discovered him and how to win friends. I discovered Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad and cash flow. When I read cash flow quadrant, 
I went out of my mind. I couldn't believe that there was responsible, wealthy people that talked about getting away from the rat race as Kiyosaki described it, right? I couldn't believe it. I lost my mind. And I became so dogged about, not to be cliche, about my reason why, right? And what I told people, and I don't, I know everybody doesn't talk this way, but I feel safe with you guys. I would tell, I would tell, I'm in scrubs, I'm in the ER. I'm entrusted with the lives of people's family members and human beings, right? And, and this is what I would say to people. Again, not because the job was so bad, I got a disclaimer, right? I said, if I knew I couldn't be living in my purpose, doing what I wanted to do, and I had to do this for the rest of my life or anything else that wasn't part of me, I said, I'd rather go home, climb in a bathtub, open my veins and call it a day. It seems extreme, <laughs> but I believe if we don't have that sort of life and death perception, mindset toward where we have to go, how we must live our lives, I don't think we can get them. Mm. It, it's, there's so much that hits us. There's so much that makes it difficult. Like I have friends and family that, that would love to move to Florida where we moved to but they can't because they're divorced and their kids are young. And I feel mm -hmm. for them. I feel for them deeply. I get it. That one might be on the shelf for a while. There's, those are very practical legal reasons, but it, it, you have to, like Eric Thomas always says, you got to want success as bad as you want to breathe. Right? Like that. It's the same thing. And the way that I look at it is I look at it as a life and death thing because I'd rather I'm not so much scared of dying as I am of scared of dying in a place I don't belong in a mm -hmm. role. I don't belong in a life. I don't belong. And, you know, I'll, I'll do this, Phil outside of that, because every situation is purely different. I would love to do to leave that right there for anybody who would want to grab a little time in my calendar and have a chat. Mm -hmm. They can do that. Oh, that's me down there. Proving to you guys that I'm a vet. That's me down there in that picture. <laughs> that's an so ad. That just, so that just opens up to your calendar so they can grab some time on your calendar. Goes right to the calendar. Yep. I'm doing I'm doing a handful of complimentary free calls this month and, and I'll give you my best. We can have a chat. If we want to go further, great. If you you want to get some resources, I'll give you everything I have on that call. Mm. That's great. That's great. And I don't set time limits, even though if you try to take three or four hours, I might steer the direction like a good host would, but outside of that, no worries. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was I was contemplating today because uh, I'm I'm freeing up some some space in my brain, and I I wrote down this you know more passive income, right? But I put why it's not the passive income I want. It's more the freedom of time. It's more the freedom of purpose. It's more the freedom to do things like this to bring people like you on and and to help as many people. Not really help, but just to share opportunities of. What a and and this is for me. What a little bit of courage, right? To gain just a little bit more courage to to have the courage to go do the things full time. Because I still don't have the confidence to to think that I could do some of the things I want to do full time, which is which is crazy at my age, right? And what I've done, and not that I don't I've think done it's crazy, crazy, crazy things. But I don't think it's crazy. Yeah, I think it's conditioning. Yeah. Oh, hundred hundred percent. It's programming and and conditioning for sure. For sure. So I really appreciate that, Adam. And and we'll we'll reshare this and everyone on this call. I have everyone's email. We'll I'll I'll put these links. I'll grab these things from you just in case. I know a couple of people had to leave um a little bit early. But this is great. And your book's gonna come out, you said in about the next 12 months. I'd like that to happen, but uh we just did a, a wholesale temp uh wholesale model that like a book model, like there's autobiographies, there's half story, half teaching. And then there's all these teaching books, right? Like the three different big areas. And we started out half and half. And I realized I'm way, I, I'm not a self-help teacher. <laughs> I can bring self-help ideas that we know about, but I, I know that I've, I got a handful of stories that have impacted people over, over the years. And when I put how I've reflected and how I've reverse engineered those into the lifestyle that we now have, I mean, my wife and I, we call our shots. She's a personal trainer. We don't have millions rolling around yet. It's not, but we control our day and we control who we talk to. We control who we work with, who we choose not to work with. 
what we choose to say yes or no to that. I thought that was nearly impossible 15, 16 years ago. Mm. It took a long time. Didn't know a deployment was going to be in there at a four year army deal, but like, you know, it's the path and you do your best with what you have, with what's right in front of you at this moment. Dad, my son, dad, how do I do this? How do I do that? How, you know, a girl over here, I, I want to get into real estate. He's got a six figure lawn business already at 20. He's had it for six years. And he goes, how do I, do? I said, dude, wake up every day, letting God know that he can use you however he wants to help people. And you're going to maximize whatever's in your hands that you have right now, because that's the soonest way. That's the fastest way to get something new in your hands is to maximize what's in them right now. Do your best with it and watch what happens. I mean, you and me are sitting here talking. It's because of that. It's because of what I was doing in the winter. And obviously your grace and, and, you know, willingness and all that has to play a part. But when you do people right, people will open doors. Mm. Yeah. The community is just so important. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All of us are less without all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't need a big community. You, you, You really don't. No, you really don't. Well, Adam, I really appreciate this, and we're we're gonna have you back on, and I wanna I wanna talk to you about a structure of doing something where we we literally have people doing the work as we're going through this, right? Like, get out the you know people and like I took I took a couple of pages of notes, um, page and a half of notes just from today, and I have so many more questions, but I want to respect everyone's time and just getting after it. So I would encourage everyone you know, today to, you know, like I put in the chat, you know, I want to, you know, I think it was number four on your list of, what did I write down? Mine was, uh, I should remember what I watched my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> right. T- take a, take an Elon Musk pause before I speak. I don't know if anyone's ever heard him speak. Like he'll, he'll pause for like 90 seconds or three minutes sometimes before he speaks. It's really awkward. Uh, but I, I need to really pause before I speak. That's something I, I need to do for sure. So I'm going to, that's going to be my goal tonight. And I'm sure my wife can hear me and she'll probably <laughs> she'll appreciate that one after 32 years. Um, but that's going to be, that's going to be my goal. So I really appreciate it. A lot of great comments in the chat and Adam, thanks again. And uh, we'll definitely catch up and I'll, I'll get with you. and We'll get these emails out uh, to our whole list actually next week. Thank you. Guys, listen, one last word. I can't see anybody. My chat's closed. I don't see anything, any names, anything. If there's anything in you that feels, ah, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Oh, he's going to, he's going to want me to do coaching. He's going to, maybe I'm going to sound stupid. Listen, anything that's coming up in your mind, if you have an inclination to talk with me and run a couple ideas, get something off your chest, see what I think about something else. That's your sign. (laughs) Give me a shout. You will be glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Appreciate everybody. And yeah. uh, Adam, we'll guys. definitely catch up and, and we'll connect before we, we send this email out next Tuesday. Cool. Very good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, bye-bye.